Amen. Let's turn in your Bibles this morning back to John, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And um, over the next couple of weeks, I want us to look at this passage, verses 13 through 19. Uh, as I often intend to do, is to cover all of those verses in one week, and yet you realize pretty quickly that's just not going to happen. And so I want to split up our time this week in looking at really the, the reality of Christ's call of his disciples. And the next week, we'll actually look at the men themselves that Mark records for us. But if you recall from last week, Mark recorded us with a, a summary of Jesus' ministry, the one in which he put forth the evidence and support of the initial thesis of his gospel that he wrote in the opening verse to show that Jesus is the Son of God. Mark captured for us last week a scene in which after tactically withdrawing from the Pharisees and their desire to kill him, that Jesus took his disciples to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. But instead, as we saw last week, instead of finding peace and solace there, Mark told us that there were tens of thousands of people who were flocking to Jesus. Mark explained to us that these tens of thousands of people came from the varying areas of the region many traveling some hundreds of miles to get to Jesus. And it's in this swarm of humanity and coming to Jesus that Mark revealed for us their true intent. It was because of the miracles that he was doing. Tens of thousands of people came to Jesus in desperation to be healed, to have the demons driven out of them, and to have him provide for them what they could not provide for themselves. And our Lord even knowing the intent of their hearts, begins to show compassion and to heal them. And as he did so, Mark records for us that the crowd became even more frenzied in this act. So much so that they began to crowd in and around Jesus, trying to but even touch him if possible. And in doing so, found that even touching of his garments would but bring the healing power needed to bring full restoration to their maladies. Matthew noted in his gospel for us, this was because of the power that was flowing in and through him. That is to say that in his divine nature, his omnipotent power, that creative transcendent power that belongs to God himself, that we see, the, see creating the world out of nothing and bringing spiritual life to the sinner was flowing from Jesus, healing all that he touched. We also saw last week that while Jesus was demonstrating for tens of thousands to see his divine nature, that the majority of those that were healed that day in no way actually bowed the knee to him as Lord. But in their absence, Mark noted for us that there were those who were under condemnation that did, the demons did that day. They both recognized and named Jesus as the true Son of God. And upon Jesus' command, they came out of those he commanded to do so. And the mouths of those who wanted to continue to identify his true nature and title were shut. It's the summary of Jesus' ministry that Matthew tells us served a more significant purpose than merely a summary of events. But rather, as Matthew explains in his gospel, this ministry, according to Matthew 12, 17 through 21, was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant in whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit within him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. That is to say that as one might be tempted to be through a cursory reading of Mark's summary to think that these events were driven by these desperate people or the popularity of Jesus. But that wasn't the true reason as we learned last week for these events. It was because Christ was demonstrating that he was indeed the Son of God. He was in his ministry acting in perfect accordance with and fulfilling the prophecy that the Lord had given Isaiah some 700 years earlier before the coming of his son, the Messiah. 
And in demonstrating the scope of Jesus' ministry, Mark is affirming what he set out again to do in his opening verse of his gospel, and that is to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. That brings us to our passage this morning. That as Jesus tactically withdrew from the religious leaders' desire to kill him, it also served another purpose in his ministry, and that was to name the 12 men who would be his disciples. Let's read Mark's account this morning, chapter 3, verse 13, going through verse 19. He says this, And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them he gave the name Barjonas, which means sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the Iscariot, who betrayed him. Over the next two weeks, I want us to see Jesus calling of these 12 men, and in doing so, what I want us to see is the Lord's power to call and to equip men to be faithful for his kingdom work. The power of God to call and to equip men for the purpose of his kingdom work. And the first thing I want us to see this morning is the sovereign summoning of these men. A sovereign summoning of these men. Verse 13, it says, And he, meaning Jesus, went up on the mountain and summoned those who he himself wanted. Mark informs us that after the scene of Jesus' power that he retreats upon a mountain. What mountain specifically we're not told, but based on its proximity to the Sea of Galilee in the context of getting away from the hustle and the bustle of Capernaum, it's likely as an area known as the Horns of Hattin. This site is an extinct volcano with twin peaks. You can see it there in the photo with the Sea of Galilee sitting there in the background. So it's likely this is where Jesus retreated away to. And in retreating to the mountain, Luke in his gospel informs us he did so to pray. Luke says this, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 5 verse 16 that this was a common practice of our Lord that he would often slip away to the wilderness to pray. To get away from the demands of, and the needs of people, our Lord would retreat to a secluded place to commune with his Father, to be refreshed, to be prepared for certain aspects of his ministry, and in the case of our passage this morning, in preparation for a large decision. In fact, Luke adds that Jesus spent the whole night in prayer to God. That's an indictment, isn't it? <laughs> Listen, in his divine nature, what we must continue to understand is that Jesus constantly enjoyed from eternity past an ongoing, perfect, uninhibited communion with his Father. So the time in prayer that our Lord here is not reflective of his divine nature, for he needed nothing, but rather in this time spent away in prayer was really a reflection of his humanity. In doing so, our Lord then sets the pattern and importance of prayer for us here. Simply put, if we would say it this way, if Jesus' priority and practice was prayer, how much more should it be for us? This includes the times away for dedicated time of refreshing in prayer, the need at times to get away from the busyness of life, the demands of work and obligations, and the activities that consume our time to go to a place where we can confess, we can meditate on the Word of God, and we can commune with God. I personally can testify, even over this last week, that it is often in those times that many of the issues and the decisions that are hard for us to see clearly in the throes of life and ministry become clear through that sweet communion that we have with God in prayer alone and uninhibited by the daily needs and demands of life. But it says our Lord here spends all night in prayer that in the morning, as Luke adds, Mark states that Jesus summoned those who he himself wanted. Mark's use here of the phrase tells us two realities of the call of these 12 men by Jesus. First of all, it was sovereignly initiated by him. 
It was sovereignly initiated by him. Mark here uses the word summoned. It means to call to oneself. The verb here is in the middle voice, indicating that it is this act, this call, this summoning that was done out of a personal desire by Jesus and then carried out to completion through his sovereign power. We see this reality played out in John chapter 15, verse 16 in Jesus' words, where he states that his disciples became his disciples through this sovereign call. He says this, you did not choose me, but I, I chose what? You. But not only was this call of his disciples sovereignly initiated, it was secondly a particular or a specific calling. A particular or a specific calling. Mark notes in his gospel that Jesus' sovereign summoning of these disciples was, quote, those who he himself, what, wanted. Those who he himself wanted. That is to say that amidst the number of followers that were truly there following him, there were within that group a smaller group, particular individuals that he, out of his own free and sovereign choice, chose to be his disciples. In simple terms, Jesus wasn't looking for volunteers. He chose the men that he desired to choose for his specific task. It doesn't speak here of randomness or chance. It doesn't speak of finding any good within them, as it were, but rather an intentionality and a divine degree of insight and desire that only God can do. Jesus, by his own divine purpose and prerogative, chose these particular men in accordance with his particular sovereign plan. It's out of then this sovereign summoning that secondly we see a sovereign appointment. A sovereign appointment. It says this, when he summoned them, they came to him and he appointed 12. He appointed 12. So these men, upon hearing Christ's sovereign summons, these men out of this larger group respond in coming forward to him. And there are three distinctions that Mark, along with the other Gospels, want us to understand about these men that they list. The first of which is that they are called disciples. Disciples. Mark here refers to this group of men as they, but Luke informs us that these men were called his disciples. Now when we hear the word disciple, our words might go back to the, the Sunday school definition that you might have as a follower of Christ. And that would be true to a large extent. But the word for disciple goes deeper than that. The word for disciple does mean follower, but it is one who follows with a purpose, one who is a learner, one who is a student, one who has come to subject himself to the master in order to learn what he has to teach. This was someone who followed the master, the teacher, to learn everything they could from him. This was a common practice of the rabbis of the day. As rabbis would go around teaching, they would often attract followers to themselves, those who wished to learn from their ways, and in doing so, would become, become their follower with a desire to have them impart their knowledge to them. This was a college, essentially. You go to the college, which you want to learn from. These men went to the great rabbis that they want to learn from. But although as we've seen, Jesus attracts many people that unlike the students of the rabbis who chose them, Jesus' followers didn't choose him. He chose them. He hand-picked them individually to be his followers. Jesus was the one who took the initiative in calling these men who were to learn from him. And this learning would happen in the context of a very close and personal relationship with Jesus as they traveled with him, as they ate with him, as they aided him in carrying out his ministry, this was truly doing life as it were with the master. These men were to be those who followed him, that he would spend intimate time with, that he would pour into them, and that he would expose them to ministry and to teach them everything that they would need to know to carry out his ministry after his ascension. 
Luke here specifically notes for us that Jesus chose a particular number. It's the number what? 12. So Jesus here as the sovereign Lord could have chosen any number of disciples and yet he chose 12. So the question is why? Well, let me show this to you. Luke in his gospel provides the first part of this explanation in Luke chapter 22, verse 29 through 30, he says this, and just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and that you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus' declaration here is that these 12 disciples apart from Judas will sit with Christ ruling and reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel with him in his millennial kingdom. But not only will they rule over the 12 tribes as Jesus states, they will also eat and drink at his table in the kingdom. So what is the significance of this reality? Luke again in his account of Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper explains it further this way. It says, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, that's the disciples, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why? For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten and said, This cup is poured out for you is what? The new covenant in my blood. Jesus here, upon instituting the Lord's Supper, transforms the old covenant Passover meal into the new covenant ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Passover meal that they enjoyed that night with all of its symbols and with all of its pictures of Christ became a new ordinance, one that reflected a new covenant in which those old covenant pictures would find the reality in Christ and in Christ alone. And Jesus says here, it was a covenant, a new covenant that was to be ratified by what? His blood. And as Jesus is doing so, as he expresses to his disciples that he has longed to take this meal with them, to teach them, as it were, as his disciples of the realities of the new covenant he was ushering in through the death and resurrection. And in doing so, Jesus makes this prophetic statement concerning the 12, that they would not take his table again until he ate and drank with them in what? his kingdom. Jesus says this, I'm going to give you a picture to carry out as a reminder of what it will be like for you and I to sit in my kingdom to eat and drink at its fulfillment. So the 12 were those who were to reign and feast with Christ in his millennial kingdom. They were those to have a place of authority over the 12 tribes of Israel serving under Christ as Israel's rightful king. So the question is, what's the significance of that? Well, think about this. Did Israel have leaders from the 12 tribes of Israel at this time? Did they have scribes? Did they have priests? Did they have a high priest? Did they have teachers of the law? Did they have the next generation of disciples who would attach themselves to these rabbis to learn their ways? Of course they did. But what Jesus was saying in appointing the 12 was that what he was doing is he was doing away with the old covenant for a new one. And in doing so, he was rejecting Israel's leaders who he learned a few weeks ago who had established his Roman states a righteousness through a religious system that was in pursuit of a righteousness that was not in accordance with the knowledge of God. It was a self-righteousness. This point often gets lost on us because we don't live in first century Palestine. 
Upon Jesus coming, his claims, his working of his miracles, his ability to forgive sin, all pointed to the reality of him as the long-awaited Messiah. Yet the people who would have questioned, asked the question, if this man is the Messiah, why are not Israel's leaders reigning and ruling with him? Jesus' message was very clear. I am rejecting Israel and her leaders. And I'm calling men to myself, common men, uneducated men, who I will train and will carry out the ministry of the kingdom and who will reign and rule with me when my millennial physical kingdom comes. This partial rejection of Israel even continues today as Paul states in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, that through a partial hardening of Israel's hearts towards their Messiah, there is according to God's plan of redemption, the fullness of the Gentiles coming into the kingdom. And as the fullness of the, of the Gentiles come, at which time when this occurs during the seven year tribulation, God then will turn his face back to Israel in bringing about a national revival. So while we recognize that there are similarities between Israel and the church, Christ here affirms there is a clear distinction between the two. The church being brought about through the new covenant, that mystery that was to be revealed, as Paul says in Ephesians 3, birthed on the day of Pentecost and evidenced here by the rejection of Israel and her leaders and by the leadership chosen in the new covenant to rule over this future kingdom. So these men are chosen for this specific purpose. But Luke, but Luke adds that not only were they named disciples, but in calling them to be his disciples, he also called them what? Apostles. Apostles. Luke says this, in whom he also named as apostles. The word for apostle itself means one who is sent out or commissioned. The New Testament uses this title in a broad sense as well as in a very narrow sense as well. The broader sense is used to describe men like Barnabas, Epaphroditus, Apollo, Salvanius, and Timothy. Men who were sent out and commissioned to serve the Lord. But there is this second group, the 12 as they come to be known in the Gospels, as well as Matthias who would replace Judas and the Apostle Paul who would encounter Jesus on the road to Damascus who would receive his commissioning. These men would not only be disciples of Christ, learners and followers, they would also serve a unique purpose and role in the early church. The New Testament says that these men, these apostles, would serve as the very foundation of the church. That is to say that they lay the very foundation of this new spiritual entity called the church in which the dividing wall that had once separated Jews and Gentiles was done away with and with the groups that were once separate becoming one through the spiritual formation of the church. So the question is, how did the apostles serve as the foundation of the church? First of all, they did so through their laboring to preach the gospel, establishing churches, and then to train and raise up elders who could pastor those churches. Secondly, they did so by serving as the standard or the model of the moral qualifications of leadership that the church was to follow and to use for their future eldership. Thirdly, they were given these miraculous powers to substantiate their claims and the message of the gospel that they preached. But primarily, these chosen apostles, these 12 these 11 minus Judas served as the very foundation of the church through writing the New Testament scripture. Paul speaks of this reality in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 when he says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given me to me for you, that by revelation... There was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into what? The mystery of Christ, 
which in other generations was made, not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and what prophets in the Spirit. Paul says that mystery of the gospel of Christ and of the church has now been revealed under the inspiration of the Spirit through Christ's apostles, of whom Paul here is writing to the church in Ephesus about. In John chapter 14, verse 26, and John chapter 15, verses 26 through 27, Jesus himself pre-authenticated the writing of the New Testament through these apostles. Listen to what he says. 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will what? Teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, this is not an excuse to not know your Bible and depend upon the Spirit to give you the words to say when you don't have them. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a very specific act that the Spirit is gonna do when he comes at the day of Pentecost. What is it? That the Spirit then would bring understanding to the things that they were taught, but they could not understand when he was with them. We see this over and over, do we not? Jesus does something, he comes back and says, what do you think about that? And they kind of shrug their shoulders like, I don't know. Jesus here is promising that when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, he is going to give the disciple, these apostles, the supernatural ability to perfectly recall and understand what Christ taught them during his earthly ministry. In addition to teaching the apostles all things, he says also, he would also bring about the supernatural remembrance of all that Jesus did. All that he said, his ministry, his teachings, the miracles, the encounters with the religious leaders, all of the parables, he would bring it to mind perfectly. Why? So that the apostles, under the inspiration of the Spirit, would write the New Testament Scripture. And in doing so, that their writings then would serve as the very foundation for which the church is built upon. If you doubt this, listen to Acts chapter two, verse 42. The early church already recognized this. He says this, they were continually devoting themselves to what? To the apostles' teachings. That is to say that the early church recognized and accepted the apostles' teachings in writing as what? As the scripture. John, in writing his gospel, affirmed this reality in John chapter 21 through 24. And on 24, he says this, this is the disciple, meaning me, who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is what? True. John is stating the clear fulfillment of what Christ promised by the Holy Spirit that in teaching them all things and supernaturally bringing to remembrance all of his word and in testifying about him, Christ's promise found its fulfillment in the apostles through the writing of the New Testament scriptures. In summary, these 12 disciples whom he appointed also and called as apostles were those personally chosen to serve this privileged capacity. And after his ascension, they would serve as Christ's representative to his church. William Hendrickson in his commentary states this reality, says this, he, meaning the apostle, represents his sender, being clothed with authority over life and doctrine derived from him that is Christ. The 12 would serve with the very authority of Christ himself to the early church. But if you've read the Gospels at any time at all, you know that they needed to be trained for this reality. That's why Mark tells us secondly, or thirdly, that they were called to a sovereign purpose. A sovereign purpose. Look in verse 14. So that, for, because, so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. Mark here lists three realities of this purpose. First of all, it was to be with him, to be with him. In the context, in the timeline of Jesus' ministry now, Jesus is about halfway through his earthly ministry. 
He is roughly another 16 to 18 months before he will head to the cross. And as always, every moment in his ministry is crucial. So with the remaining time that he has, Jesus chooses these men who will be those who will have a very dedicated training. These men must be those who are by his side so that Jesus can maximize the time to train them to carry out the ministry after his ascension. Of his true followers, the gospel writers indicate to us that there were several layers or several levels, as it were, to those who followed him. You have the 70, according to Luke chapter 10, that he taught and trained in a broader sense. Those who Jesus sent then out to preach. But then you also have the 12, this smaller group of men who Jesus calls, who will have a more intimate look into Jesus' life and ministry. They will have a front seat to all of his teachings. They will have a direct access to him to ask him questions. They will have a first-hand witness to the conversations, the confrontations, and to many of the individual interactions that Jesus had with the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders. He will answer very specific questions from them over parables. He will ask them to teach back what he has just taught and to carry out the practical aspects of ministry. In short, they will receive the most priceless of training that the world has ever known, the privilege to be taught and trained for ministry by our Lord himself. And listen, they would need it. Many times we see them question our Lord as to his teachings. We see them lack spiritual understanding to give the proper response. Mark chapter four, verse 13, he says this, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all of the parables? They lack the spiritual maturity, the understanding of these things. In addition to their lack of spiritual understanding, they were also those who lacked some humility as well. They were those who desired some degree of rank and greatness within his kingdom. Even in the Last Supper, James and John, and even getting their mom involved in this process, go and request to Jesus to give them a privileged seat in his kingdom. Talk about bad timing. We see the weakness of their faith, their deserting of Jesus, their inability to drive out demon. Really what we would say is, these men needed some work. John MacArthur comments on these men saying this, Despite their privileges and importance, the apostles were by no means perfect. They were ordinary men, not stained glass saints. They had several major weaknesses which the Lord had to correct. Listen, it's easy at times that we romanticize the disciples. We enshrine them as being some kind of holy figureheads but they were common, sinful men in whom were in the need to the training, the teaching of our Lord could give them to make them into the bold and the faithful men that we see throughout the rest of the New Testament. As my mentor would say, why did God choose these particular men? Because there were no good characters. That is to say that there were not any of them who were worthy to be his disciple. In his rejection of the religious leaders, Christ was stating that no education, no status, or family heritage entitled them to this call. It was only by Christ's sovereign choice that he chose these particular 12 men. Men who would spend every day with him for the rest of his ministry. They would watch him do the extraordinary in miracles and signs and wonders. Restoring limbs, taming creation, providing food from nothing, and raising people from the dead. They would watch him go toe-to-toe with the religious leaders. They would hear him teach the gospel, his death, his judgment, and his coming kingdom. They would hear the parables he taught and implore him for true spiritual meaning and understanding to them. And they would see him hang on a cross, enduring the full wrath of God on behalf of those who would believe for six full hours. They would also be those who saw him resurrected, even touching him and embracing him after his resurrection, this serving as his witness. They would watch him sleep, eat, 
go away to commune with the Father, to hear him pray for people, and many times pray for them. These men walked with our Lord, they listened, they asked, they observed, doing what he taught them in his words, and then showed them in the reality of his life. He knew their weaknesses. He knew their sinful tendencies, their fears, their lack of understanding, and he knew their desires perfectly. And yet he continued to pour himself into them for the task that was to come to become the very foundation of the church. The time of being with him in his ministry was crucial for their training as well as God's program that he had set forth for the church. But there were two other aspects to this call, the second of which was the call to carry out ministry. And he did so in two ways. Secondly, to send them out to preach. To send them out to preach. Mark here notes the directive of Christ to carry out the primary function of their ministry was to be, and that was preaching and teaching. Just as we learn the word preach and is to the word keruso, we have seen John K. Russo calling the people to repentance just as our Lord came into Galilee. As our Lord came into Galilee, we see him, K. Russo, the gospel. So these men then were sent out to Christ to what? K. Russo as well. Just as it were with their teacher, so this was to be their primary task of their Christ-ordained ministry. Mark notes here that these men were sent out to preach the Greek verb here is a Greek transliteration in the English language. It's the word aposteos. It's where we get the noun form of the title apostle. It means someone who has been sent out as a direct representative of an authority. This, this word doesn't refer to someone who merely delivers a message on behalf of someone else. It is a stronger and more defined word than that. It is one who carries the same authority and directive power of the one who sent them. In a very easy sense, they were a proxy of the governing person. In the context of the verse, the 12 men whom Jesus called and sent to preach, their words as his aposteos carried the same authority as Jesus himself in his teaching. And they did so by the authority given to them by Christ as well as by the message itself. These men were not trained teachers. They were untrained by the religious standards of the day. They had not been trained in the little rabbinical schools there in Jerusalem, and yet, under the power of the Spirit, trained in the message of the gospel, they served as Christ's direct representative in proclaiming the gospel that he himself taught. Jesus also then gave them his authoritative stamp of approval as his apostles by giving them, thirdly, the authority to cast out the demons. The authority to cast out demons. As we see throughout the Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus himself did many signs and wonders throughout his ministry. And while those miracles and those signs and those wonders were often done to aid those who were suffering from various conditions, even demon possession, they served also a greater purpose. And that was to be a sign, a proof to validate his claims and his teaching. We've seen this over and over in Mark's gospel where Jesus' ministry began with his preaching and teaching and then to demonstrate the people his authority over his claims, he turns back the effects of the fall in healing those with the most severest of conditions and diseases as well as displaying the authority of his power and control over Satan and his demons. It's the same authoritative power that Jesus here imparts to these 12 men to cast out demons as a sign of that same authority. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says, chapter two, verse three and four. It says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, there's our Lord's authority, and it was confirmed to us by those who what? Heard, that's the apostles. God also testifying with them by what? By signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to what? His will. 
writer of Hebrews says this, just as God testified to the salvation that Christ preached through miracles, signs, and wonders by the working of the Holy Spirit, so that time working of the Holy Spirit in power was seen where? Through the apostles. For what purpose? To validate the preaching and calling people to salvation that can only be found in Christ. And while in the calling of these 12 men, Jesus empowered them to do so, it didn't mean that it wouldn't come with hard times and persecution. In Matthew's gospel, upon calling of his 12, Jesus informs them of this hard road that is to come. And by way of implication this morning, I want us to examine a number of truths that Christ informed these 12 men would be their realities in being his disciples as well as the disciples who would come after him, us. The first implication is this. Jesus' disciples will face rejection and persecution by a God-hating world. Jesus' disciples will face a rejection and a persecution by a God-hating world. Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, uses a well-known and graphic illustration to describe this reality. He says this, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of what? Wolves. Jesus' illustration here doesn't have the wolves coming upon the sheep, but rather a sheep being dropped into a world in which they are to enter the wolves on their own territorial domain. This speaks of the dangerous reality of being Christ's disciple. We, like the apostles, have been sent out into a very dangerous culture, and we bring a message that calls the world to account for their sin and calls them to submit to the lordship of Christ. And it is a message that will be met with hostility, it will be met with strife, and history has proven out even death. The world in which we live is one in which savage wolves outside of the church as well as wolves who spring up within the church, false teachers, seek not just to win a position but rather to ravage and to destroy the sheep and to destroy Christ's church. Christ says, this is what I'm going to send you out into. And this reality spreads to virtually every aspect of life. First of all, he says, it's gonna spread to the civil and the religious. The civil and the religious, John chapter 10, verse 20, or 17. He says, but beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. Verse seven tells them that it is certain that men whose hostility to the gospel will hand them over to the government and to the religious institutions. Throughout human history, they have been two great enemies of the church, and many times they were acting in concert to each other. That's the civil authorities, and that's religious authorities, and even the church. Jesus says, beware of these men. But not only is it civil and religious, this also occurs in familial relationships. Familial relationships Secondly, this persecution extends from the outside world, from the civil and the religious, to the home, to the most intimate of relationships, the family. Matthew 10, 21, brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, and children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Jesus, Jesus says this, even in those most tender and intimate of relationships is not immune from the hate and the persecution that you're going to face. And notice here, Jesus doesn't describe this as kind of a cold shoulder at a family gathering or getting your feelings hurt by a brash family member at a reunion. But rather, those closest of relationships causing them to be what? Put to death. They are ones going to the magistrate. They are the ones going to the false teachers. They are the ones going to the religious accusing you. They are the ones who are handing you over, selling you out to be put to death. Listen, at times, tragically, our own family members can be those who can be the most hostile to us and to the gospel. 
But Christ doesn't give an exemption for us in that. We don't get a pass. But rather, he assumes by his statement here that you will be living a godly life, and as you do so, you are testifying of the gospel to them. And in doing so, he says what? You will face persecution from them. Possibly, he says, even unto death. So the question is why? Why this hostility? Why this persecution? Christ gives them the reason in verses 24 through 25 of Matthew chapter 10. He says this, disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he became like his, his teacher and the slave like his master. And they have called the head of the house Beelzebub. How much more will they malign the members of his what? Household. Jesus is saying, if I suffered, you're going to suffer. He's clear. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And in choosing you, I made you my disciple. And no pupil is greater than his master. As a slave to Christ, we do our master's bidding. Therefore, if they persecuted me, they must, must definitely persecute you. Paul exhorted Timothy with this same reality. He said this in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. Paul tells Timothy, given the time in which you live, Timothy, don't be surprised when you face persecution for living a godly life. It happened to our Lord, therefore, it's gonna happen to you. Listen, we can't maneuver through this life trying to avoid persecution if we are living a godly life. If we are giving a godly life, persecution will find you. We can deceive ourselves at times that we can somehow gingerly avoid hard conversations, awkward social moments brought about through the sharing of truth and believe that we can win someone to Christ merely with our lives, never opening our mouth with the truth of the gospel. And we do so all the time, trying to avoid the persecution that Christ says, if you are living a godly life, you will face. And yet in doing that, we are doing nothing more than living in disobedience to our Lord's command and we are suppressing the truth for what? For the sake of being what? Man pleasers. Listen, compromising on the truth in order to bring you favor with the world is a dangerous game. Let me say it again, a deadly game. Listen to what our Lord says to his disciples in that same passage, Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 38. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not what? Worthy of me. Christ said, I have sent you out as a sheep among wolves. So the question is, in the context of this reality, context of these hard times, in the context of being those who are chosen of Christ, being his disciples, being laid as it were into the territory of the wolves, what hope do we have? Listen to what he says in verse 22 of Matthew 10. You will be hated by all because of what? My name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Listen, though we feel at times that our life goes from one conflict to the next, being rejected by the world, civil authorities, and even being rejected by the closest of family relationships, listen, we're in good company. Our Lord experienced the same. His disciples, his apostles experienced the same. Church history tells us that the faithful men and women of church history experienced the same. Therefore, we should expect no other. He is the same Lord who calls his disciples to suffer in this way, but he is also the one who empowers them to do so. And he is the one who preserves them to the end. 
You see, the endurance that Christ speaks of here is not the source of, nor does it produce our salvation, but rather being faithful and enduring hardship and persecution because of it, it is a proof that we are his children and we truly belong to him as his disciple. Let me ask you this morning, does that describe you? Are you one who, though you experience hardship, because you are faithful to our Lord, you experience it and you do so faithfully? Who are you one who for the sake of pleasing man that you close your mouth? The latter was not the practice of the 12 that he called nor is it the practice of all those disciples he calls today. Listen, the truth, a proof of truly being his disciples is this. The one who has endured to the end, what? Will be saved. That's the reality. That's the reality that Christ called these men to. If you're in Christ this morning, there's not a higher plane of consciousness that you get to as a disciple. When you, become in, when, you get to, uh, when you are becoming in Christ, when you're regenerated through the gospel, you instantaneously become a disciple. This is your life. This is the reality of your life. And it's the one that Christ, through his power of the Spirit, empowers you to do so. And in doing so, enduring to the end, prove the genuineness of your salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your work in these men. Father, ordinary men, men of no reputation, men of no education, of no social status. And Father, yet in Christ, he was the one who chose them particularly, sovereignly, summoning them to himself to spend the time with them, to train them for ministry a ministry that he would bring about as being the foundation of the church in their writings and in their life and in their leadership. They would be those who would set the stage, set the very foundation of what the church was to follow in being obedient to it. And Father, even as Christ appointed these 12 in Mark, Matthew 10, he's very clear that what will come with that reality are the dangers and the persecution of living in a God-hating world. They will be those who will face persecution. They will be those who are let out, as it were, in the midst of the wolves. Those who were considered, as it were, sheep to be slaughtered. Those who life and ministry will be a constant testimony to the world of their inadequacy and their rebellion against you apart from turning to Christ. Father, I even prayed this morning for those who are here who have fooled themselves into thinking that they are a true disciple of Christ and yet they have never taken upon themselves as it were the mantle of persecution and affliction. Who have tried to sidestep their life by weaving in and out of those hard conversations and those opportunities to share the truth and of being a testimony to Christ. I pray that today, Father, that you would not let them leave without being convicted. Father, for those who are in Christ this morning, who know what it mean, means to be persecuted, who know what it means to be persecuted even in the most closest of relationships and the family relationships. Father, I pray for strength this morning. I pray for clarity. I pray for the ability to love and be concerned for those people, to share the truth with them, not in a domineering way, but in a way that truly desires them to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your gracious work. In Christ's name, amen.